so that made our relationship not a great relationship yeah. either because coming to work every day and then taking it home with you at night time just it wasn't right so if i was to just die tomorrow the boys would have memories of me that they would never have gotten if we were just in australia there is no money in the actual items that you have in your house everything like you worked so hard to get all this stuff for what Hi everyone, it's Jimmy and Pauline and we're on Families on the Horizon and this is the pilot episode of the Families of the Horizon podcast. We're going to share our tips and tricks and, and help to inspire a few families to head to the horizon. So we're in Kuching at the moment, which is in Sarawak, which is a part of Malaysia. So we had a really awesome day today. I learned a lot about Kuching. So giving a big shout out to Kuching. It's a fantastic place if you ever want to visit. So who are we? Like I said, I'm Jimmy and I'm Pauline. We have been on the road now for... Just under three months. Just under three months. And we headed off on this journey in early February. And what we are doing is a year-round trip around Southeast Asia. Full-time travel family. Yeah, so we've been on this trip now for three months and I'm enjoying it. Are you enjoying it? Enjoying it. Definitely enjoying it. One of the things that we just had to do, there was there was no no way we weren't going to do it. Yeah, it, it's it's been on our bucket list for a very long time. Yeah. Paul and I travelled together as a couple before we had children about 10 years ago yep. and it brought us closer together and we wanted to do the same things with our kids. So that's the main reason we're on this trip and that leads into why this podcast needs to exist. Well, for those who don't know, we also have another channel which is called Mitch's on the Horizon. That's like our family vlog. We get asked a lot about that and, and how we were able to afford to do this and, you know, the logistics of doing all kids. It had, work. How do you, how how do you educate the kids? them? What do they do? Are they hard work? I could never travel with kids. Why do yours seem to act quite nicely? Like all those kinds of things. And, and those questions are impossible to answer in 10 oh, minutes yeah. because most yeah. of our vlogs are in 10 minutes. And the Mitch's on the Rise channels for a different audience. It's it's for people that are wanting to like maybe do shorter trips and yeah. like to experience certain places. So we wanted to have a place on the internet that was specifically for families that were in our position a year ago. Just, you know, maybe not happy with their car life, but wanting to do a big trip. Doesn't matter whether it's to Asia or around Australia. Yeah. So uh, we just wanted to create something that uh, was longer than 10 minutes so where we could talk and give our thoughts and be a little bit more candid about the pros and cons of what we're doing. Uh, and we can dive a lot deeper on the this channel when we can start to make videos on this channel that are specifically around like how to pack a bag yeah. you know the things you're going to need insurances the stuff that's maybe a little bit more dry uh for someone that's maybe not thinking of doing this trip but is just enjoying the content that's on bitches on the horizon so it's by liking it so if you're watching this and you're our friends uh you know watching just to support us make sure to leave a review take the five minutes to do that if you're watching this on youtube make sure to subscribe to the channel uh make sure to subscribe to our other channel which is on the horizon too all right, so I really wanted to start with our backstory mm -hmm. and how we got to where we are now, where we're on this trip. But before we do, yeah. it's been three months. Right. What has been the most enjoyable part of the trip for you so far? I think it's really cliche, but it's actually spending more time as a family. Like we spend more time as a family, but then you also spend more time individually. Like you can actually spend time with just one kid and then the next kid and then just you and I don't know it's just like you see I've seen differences in all of us and you actually get to know them and love them more and just appreciate being in their company rather than like we were saying last night the running around that you used to do of dropping the kids off and packing lunches and doing the chores and doing this and doing that it's actually just slowing down and being in the moment and okay. realising that everyone is actually happy where they are and what they're doing. Okay. Yeah, that's a really good point. I was going to say something similar. You don't realise how little time you spend together until you start spending a lot of time together. And on this trip, we've spent more time together as a family than we ever have. And yeah. I was saying that to Pauline as we were walking yesterday. I was like, <laughs> you know, the amount of time we spent driving around and doing things that didn't actually make a difference in our lives, yeah. it was just a waste of time. Now... Uh, after spending so much time together as a family, I really see how much time we wasted as a family. We always tried to make up for that by like really pushing hard for the experiences that we do have. But because we're having so many experiences together, our lives have just gotten simpler and mm -hmm. we're way more, you know, oh, we'll just go with the flow. We don't need to do things every day. Uh, it's just a better life, yeah. uh, even though it's stressful pretty stressful way to live there are stressful times like your anxiety and your stress can go through the roof but then there's other days when nothing happens yeah the world's and, perfect and it's fine yeah like, 100 uh yeah i wanted to talk a little bit about our backstory yeah. um i think we go back to the maybe a 
six months before we decided to actually make this trip. So so for background, you know, we're a family of four. We're just an average family. You know, there's Paul and I, and we got two boys, Liam yeah. and Riley, and they're six and eight. And we were just an average family. We, really were. Yep. School. Then, <laughs> Lens went to school. You know, I played football, work, work and uh, for co- we may be and unique in the fact that we had our own business. Yeah. Uh, we had a marketing, digital marketing business, but it was very locked down to one location. We yeah. were, we're based out of Mandarin in Western Australia, which... Ugly is one of the nicest places on the planet, um, and this trip for everyone. Yeah, I mean, yes, I was going to say you don't realize that until you actually leave. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's a hundred percent the the case. And we decided to come on this trip because so we're living a very middle class Australian lifestyle. Uh, but I can only speak for myself. But I, I wasn't happy. Um, you know, we had a lot of stress um, with the business and. Uh, you know, external stresses. My mum's got Alzheimer's, which um, created a whole bunch of stress in our family as well. And anyone that has family that has Alzheimer's will know what that's like. And it's not an easy disease, no. disease to, to go through at all. But, but, but besides that, really, we didn't have financial um, stresses like a lot of people do. We had a lot of money saved up and uh, we we're running a business. So a lot of our stress actually came from the business um, because we work together and in the business. And also didn't realise how much of that stress actually came from the business and you were having different stress to what I was yes. having. So that made our relationship not a great relationship yep. either because coming to work every day and then taking it home with you at night time, it just, it wasn't yep. working. And, and we would just talk about business 24-7 yeah. because yeah. when you're, both have a vested interest in making it work, you kind of have to. And then you'd have the client emails at like 9.30 at night and you'd have to deal with them there and then, like you felt like you had to deal with them. So you yep. would never switched off, just yep. never, never and, switched off. So life was not running a great course. Yeah. And and we were very lucky in the fact that, you know, a marketing agency is a business that's traditionally not really planted in one spot yeah. a lot of the time. I remember coming home one day and talking to Pauline about this and saying, why we started, we always started the business that we had. We always started it as a, a business to support our lifestyle. At some point in that, three or four years when we were building the business up, it flicked over to being, mm-hmm. yeah, to being making as much money as we can. Yeah. And with that came a lot of stress of like growing because we got to the point where we had 14 staff um, and uh, all the stresses that come with that clients that were stressed out and stressing us out. Just falling off everywhere. Yeah. Like we had not planned to have that many staff and managing it was not going well and it just, it wasn't working in our favor. No. No, and I came home to Pauline one day, and one of the things I've always enjoyed doing is watching uh, other YouTubers that have like uh, travel channels, you know, being, seeing people that are on yeah. like this journey and yeah. being in admiration of what they've been able to yeah. do. And I said to Pauline one day, I was like, why are we working this hard when mm-hmm. when really we should be in a position to be able to do we that? Should be there. Well, yeah. That should be us that we're, we're asking that. And, yeah. and then you'll get to know this as you watch this, watch us for a while. I'm a pretty impulsive person. And once I make my mind up about something, it's it's kind of hard to not think about it 24 seven. It then just goes to me of organizing yeah. like, what we do. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and that's sort of where we ended up is I got it in my mind that two, one plus one, the way we were living in Australia, one plus one wasn't making, wasn't equaling two in the fact that like, our, our actions weren't giving us the outcome that we wanted. Yeah, you know, we were doing what everyone else was doing. You know, we we had the boat, we had the car, we had the caravan. We were going on weekend adventures, but it just wasn't enough. We just yeah. we couldn't get them often enough, um, and that was stressful because it would only be a two or three day thing, and you come home feeling more exhausted than than before. So it was great to have all those things, but it just we knew that something wasn't quite right. For some people, that fills the bottle up. Yeah. You know, some people that fills their cup up perfectly. There's people I know. Uh, one of my good friends, um, you know, Tony. He he can just go away on a weekend camping adventure by himself, and that's enough to fill his cup. And he's a happy dude. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've never been like that. I've never been able to just go on a weekend full driving trip and just be happy. Because yeah. uh, I just not. I just you know I enjoy that stuff, but not in the same way. There's people out there that enjoy fishing, and they'll stay up to three in the morning watching fishing videos and get up at two in the morning to go fishing. Uh, I'm just not that kind of person. I, I, I'm i a homebody as much as I like going out, outdoors. I, I'd rather spend time at home with Pauline and the kids. But then the flip side is, like, if we went on a longer holiday, which we would try and 
do either two or four weeks, which you should get a year. We physically couldn't do it because every time we left to go on a holiday for two weeks, we'd still have staff calling us client emails that we'd have to deal with. Some days we'd have to work. We then had your mum who was in, had to be in care and then that would cause a rift as well. So there was just like all of these factors that were just not adding up. We couldn't go away for a weekend because it just didn't feel right. You couldn't go away for two to four weeks because logistically it just never worked out. Yeah. So what do you do? Like, what do you do? And I feel like there's a lot of people in this situation. You know, long story short, uh, we had everything in life that should have made us happy. Yeah. And, but it just, for I can only speak for me, but... It just wasn't making me happy. Yeah. I'm not sure about you, Pauline, but like, yeah, we had everything we needed in life and it just wasn't making us happy. And I feel like there's a lot of people in that situation. Basically about in July, probably early June. Yeah, I um, actually remember the day very clearly. Yeah, yeah. I had a pretty substantial, you know, we, we went, so we, we decided, obviously it's not like just buying a car where you can <laughs> kind of do it on a whim and make it work. Be like, ah! This. Yep. So you know, if you're going to uproot your life and do something for 12 months, yeah. you need to make sure that's the right decision. Not only for us, we have children and they need to, we need to make sure that it works for them. So we decided that the best way to go about this was to actually have a vacation uh, for three weeks in mm. uh, Malaysia, in, yeah. in a place called Joel, Joel Barut, uh, JB, uh, where Legoland is. So we had a yeah. three week vacation and we kind of treated that as the training wheels for if we were going to do that because... After three, after a week or two, uh, you'll decide if you enjoy it or not. So we because you kind of have to get over the first week because the first week is very much like the stress is still there, the logistics are still there, no one's really settled into what they're supposed to be doing. Like you've still got, are you in holiday mode? Are you in work mode? Like, do we go to an attraction today? Like, there's all these things in that first week. You've kind of got to get over that, and then into the next couple of weeks of like. Okay, this is doable. Yeah, this is how we figure that out. Like you just, you've got to get into that routine, which we, um, we had definitely had stresses over that, but we saw, we saw the light at the end of the tunnel that it actually could be done. Yep. And I think what the, what came out of that trip was that like, we were slowly removing the barriers and not doing it. So I think a lot of people don't do a trip like this because there's so many, uh, barriers that are, that are foreign, that it's easier just to stay in the way you you start, like, you start writing that to-do list in your head or even on paper and it gets it's very hard. It, it just seems like you could never, ever get it. Yep. And so after we did the J, JB trip for three weeks, the kids loved it. We yep. loved it. Yep. Uh, even though it had some hiccups along the way, yep. overall we loved it and we made that decision. You know, it was like in mid-July, I had a massive breakdown about a client yeah. and I said to Paul, let's, why are we doing this? Like, yeah. You said to me, you actually said to me, we either grow and we put on more people and it go, we try and make this work or we just say to ourselves, that's it. Yeah. We keep what we want and we keep the work that we want and we have to go wholeheartedly into this journey. I think you missed a bit. I went, let's oh. shut this business oh, down. Right, yes, okay. And then Pauline managed to turn it into like, why don't we just <laughs> kind of like keep, like make it smaller. Because I was like, no, I'm done. Let's yeah. close the close the doors. Shut oh, that's right. You were completely done. I was, I was yeah. completely done. Which added the the six months before we left on this trip was this probably the stre most stressed we've ever been in our lives because we had to unwind a business with 14 people. Yeah. Uh, make it smaller. So we let 10 people go, uh, yeah. which was incredibly stressful. You know, completely pack up a house yeah. and a life and sell sell, sell our life essentially. Two cars, a caravan, a boat, and a whole house worth of stuff is not an easy feat to do. Like, at all. It took us months. Months and months. So so we, we made the decision in July that we were going to do this trip. We didn't tell anyone except for our operations manager yeah. um, because he's a pretty cool part. Family and, and family and friends, of course. Yeah. And then we started unwinding what we yeah. had, which is a, is a really scary thing to do when you have a lot. Yeah. So we've worked incredibly hard in our life to get to the point we we have yeah. and just to unwind it for cents on the dollar yeah. because that's the first thing you realize if you decide to do a trip like this and you have to sell things is that you realize how little that stuff is worth not only from a dollar perspective but even just to you as a person um you can literally stand there and you stand there and let's say your kitchen and like your kitchen has unmounted a stuff in it from plates to cups to plastic to everything and you literally look at it and go, oh my gosh, 
I spent so much money on this stuff and no one wants it. Yeah. Like no one wants those plates that I spent $50 on. They're just going to go to the salvos. Yeah. Like there is no money in the actual items that you have in your house unless they're a TV, but you still then lose the money. You lose money on your washing machine, on your beds, on everything. Like you worked so hard to get all this stuff for what? That's what I, I reckon, like, for what? I reckon we would have sold everything we had for a quarter of what it was yeah. worth. Except for except for the big ticket stuff, big the cars stuff. and stuff. That yeah. would look okay money to that. But like you think about it, like a washing machine. Yeah. It, it, you pay six hundred dollars for that. Yeah. Eight hundred dollars and I think I got cash in hand at two hundred dollars. Yep. So and, and so when we first made this decision, like I said, we had several things we had to unwind and unpack. Yeah. The business was the, probably the priority because we couldn't do we couldn't do this trip we're on now if yeah. the business the way, with the way it was. That was a very um, we, we we wouldn't be leaving um, our accommodation. Well, that three weeks that we were away, yeah. we worked for a chunk of that we did. Uh, just because we had to. Like the business was still operating, there were still the problems we had uh, with having that many people. Yeah. Uh, so we had to unwind the business. We had we were in a rental, so we gave we gave them eight weeks. eight weeks. Notice. Yep. Um, while lease was up in eight weeks. Oh, no, our renewal was yeah. up, so we said we wouldn't be renewing. So that set a fine time. As soon as we signed that, yeah. the business was one thing because, uh, you know, we, we were unwinding it anyway because it was yeah. getting stressful. But as soon as we put the signature on that not renewing our lease, yeah. it became incredibly real really quickly. Oh, yeah. And um, that's when the stress started because we had a lot to do in a very short period of time. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, what we did for the next couple of months after July is just worked fo- solely focused on basically selling, uh, like reorganizing, reorganizing yeah. our life. <laughs> yeah. And that, and that, down to nothing. <laughs> people don't appreciate how hard that is with kids. Um, maybe yeah. parents do, parents do, I think. But yeah. if you've ever had to move house, that's what it's like, minus being able to move things. Yeah. So, so yeah. you have a house full yeah. of stuff. Of yep. You have, you have a house full of stuff. That you can't keep any of it. Yeah. So, you, you know, when you're moving house, it's like, oh, I'm going to throw a couple of books away or whatever. Take some stuff to that shop. You know, get rid of two or three bags of boxes. Yeah. Imagine selling everything yeah. you own. So we had a four bedroom, two bathroom house, yeah. selling everything you own and having 10, 10 or 15 boxes yeah. left out of, that's just your yeah. sentimental stuff. Yeah. Um, but, we, but I was going to say, we literally gave the kids a task. So they had a toy room and it, they had an abundance of toys, too many toys. And we said to them, right, there's a box of rubbish, there's a box for the op shop, and you can have a box each, but the box was tiny. Like, I made sure it was... Yeah, like a little teeny box. A little, little box. So they could keep whatever went in that box, and other stuff was either rubbish or the op shop. And we were actually amazed how well they did, because they'd realised, I think, the state that we were going into of like, okay, I want to go on this trip, but I can't keep my stuff, so I've just got to pick the sentimental stuff. Yep. And people ask all the time and they actually did so well. Yeah, I was very impressed. I was very, very impressed because they're like, oh, we can't keep that. We can't, we can't keep that. It's And, and we keep saying to them, it either is going into storage, which we do not have enough room for, or it goes to my mum's house, goes to Nana's house, and you won't have it for a year. So you need to make that decision. If, if it's worth enough to you and you want it at Nana's house, you're more than welcome to keep it at Nana's house if you ask her or you don't keep it. Yep. And we've never really been sentimental people. In the, like we have photos. We have and, photos. But and the you, know, the, and you know the people that have stuff hanging on their walls and like they buy, you know, they collar match their home and they have like, we've never been like home. We've never been like nesters. No. Uh, we've always moved around. So we've never... Uh, the boys, I think, inherited a bit of that from us. Mm. You know, they had their toys, and they would, and they would superficially be like, "I don't want to get rid of that." But once they understood why we were doing it, you could tell they had no real attachment to a lot of the stuff. Which I don't know if it's a good or bad thing, but it did, mm-hmm. it did make getting the boys to rem- get stuff, rid of stuff, easier. And and to be fair, I probably struggled the most out of all of us to get rid of stuff. You did that because I had. I was very ruthless at yeah. the end. I was throwing stuff out. Yeah. Things were going in the op shop, and you're like, "Are you sure?" And I was like, "I am sure." Like, I am done because <laughs> because I, I know what things are worth. Like, I, I've been selling, reselling on eBay for a couple of years, so I know the value of the stuff that we're just giving to people. And then there's people like me going to op, op shops and buying it and then reselling it. Yeah. And um, I remember we had our first garage sale, 
and we had everyone there. It was a madhouse. And, yeah. uh, you know, if you ever want to have some fun, let's have a garage sale. Uh, but we sold a bunch of stuff. But like I have my toolbox there. And I've had that toolbox since I was 17, since I was an apprentice. And uh, I just couldn't get rid of it. Like the, I, I knew I, I was like a thousand dollars. And, you know, by the end, after after the second garage sale, I was just like, just get rid of it. We can't keep it. Yeah, we sold it for like $400. $400. And it was a $3,000 toolbox. No. Um, but yeah, just like sentimental things, my car and stuff. Like I, I have a lot more attachment to stuff because, uh, yeah, I just, uh, I don't know. I just you did. worked so hard for it. And you, yeah. you'd want, and you'd literally longed for that item for so yeah. long and you purchased it. And then, oh, we go and sell it. Yeah. Um, so but it was... But the big thing about this, and we've spoken about this to each other, um, after the first garage sale, it was actually quite therapeutic to start getting rid of stuff. Yeah. Um, it's actually nice to see, like, so we worked, like, room from room. So we'd go, we did the toy room, so everything was empty out of the toy room. Then the kids' room, so they were just down to, like, a mattress on the floor and then a small box of toys. And then it moved on to the lounge room and the kitchen, and you'd literally just dwindle it down until you had the essentials. And then those essentials had to go because we were physically moving out of the house. Yep. So it was just a process and the process became harder and harder when it became the items that got smaller and smaller, like the little weird bits that you had to keep because you needed that for something or other. Like. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that, and that's a uh, big thing. You, you realize how little attachment you have to, to stuff and mm-hmm. once you start getting rid of it. And, yeah. and if I could give anyone advice, even if you're not going to go on a trip, just get rid of some stuff. Yeah, just look in that linen cupboard. Oh, the linen cupboard was yeah. the worst place ever for dumping. And the shed. And the shed. Oh, the shed was shocking. Yeah, the oh, shed. The shed was shocking. Shed. <laughs> that we had so much stuff, and and I think the part of the reason a lot of people and I and it's just speculation, but yeah. knowing what we went through, I think part of the reason a lot of people don't do a trip it's like this, hard. it's too hard. It's it hard. is. It was that was the hardest thing about doing this trip was. Um, yeah getting rid of our crap, not from yeah. a sentimental, but just like the action, oh, the jokes of the way it. Just eat. Organising it. All gives, right. me, gives me PTSD yeah, thinking about it. let's not think about that. <laughs> so anyway, we got rid of, stuff, so right? we rid of our stuff, So we got rid of our stuff and we moved out. Yep. And uh, September came around, the house was clean, we moved out. Yep. We moved in with my uh, dad and stepmom yep. um, for two months, uh, which my stepmom didn't mind, but my dad wasn't happy about. <laughs> Sorry, dad, if you're watching this, but... <laughs> You know, dad by the end was just happy to see us go. Sorry, Grumpy. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, he's a grumpy old man and, you know, that's to be expected. Um, so we, we kind of overstayed our welcome there, yeah. but dad, I knew dad would get over it because yeah. um, we had nowhere else to go to. Yeah. You know, we you, the thing with Australia at the moment is there's a huge rental crisis. We couldn't find it. We couldn't find it in accommodation. Yeah. But Paul managed to jag something that was amazing. Tell everyone about your win for our, our accommodation before we left. Right. So I was having to think about it and I was like, I don't know what to do. Like we, we needed to leave by the end of the school term. So that was like halfway through December. We needed to leave grandpa and grandma's house. So I was like, what are we going to do? We had the option of my mum and dad's house and sorry, mum and dad, we thought about staying, but we just thought the extra four of us, um, it would cause a lot of chaos. So we didn't want to upset that relationship because we have great relationship with my mum and dad. So I decided, Jimmy's actually away at the time, he was in America, and I'm going, okay, what do I do? I looked at all sorts of short-term rentals, I looked at all sorts of things, and I was like, oh, a house sitting. Let's get into house sitting, like, someone will need us, like, that, that's, that's peak Cause it, holiday Because at this period. point, we like, literally had two suitcases, no, we had, a, we had a little bit more than two suitcases. We had a little suitcases. bit more than two suitcases, but we could have... We could live in a room, we had enough stuff to live in just yeah. one room. We could have dwindled it down a bit more and put more stuff in storage and literally had just suitcase, anyway. So I signed up for all these house sitting forums and I logged into all these house sitting pages on Facebook and I just started putting a spiel up about ourselves. Anyway, I'd seen a post come up a few times about this lady and she was in Armadale, so it was a little bit far. It was like 45 to 50 minutes from Mandra and I. And we still had the office at this point, so we started to go. So we still were traveling between. So I was like, James, what do I do? Like, do I, do I talk to her? And he's like, oh, uh, you just made the call because he was 12 hours difference to us. So I just had to make the call. So I messaged her and just said, look, this is us. Um, this is who we are. Do you want to meet us? And she's like, oh, I've actually got someone coming to have a chat to me and I'll let you know. And I was like, okay, no worries. Anyway, so I thought she found someone. So I was still posting, posting, posting um, and talking to people. And then I saw her post come back up again. And I said, have you not found someone? And she's like, oh, that person fell through. I said, I'm more than happy to drive right now because we also had to take our dog with us as well. So we had the dog, the two kids and us all at someone's house, house sitting. 
And it was a lot. So I drove there. I brought the dog with us and it took in. Jimmy was still away and she loved it. She thought it was great. She was very matter of fact. She is a lovely lady and she had three dogs herself. So we had three dogs plus our dog and all the budgies that she had. And it was so amazing that her dates literally lined up. She was flying out the weekend after school finished and she was coming back the weekend before we flew out. So we were there for just a month and a half, I think it happened, because literally her dates lined up with our dates. And we house sat for a month and a half um, while traveling backwards and forwards to Mandarin and tidy up the office, because that's a whole other thing we had to organize selling computers. Yeah. 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 We thought we thought getting rid of our stuff was hard. Try selling computers and desks and things like yeah. that. You know, that was another, we had a full office, you know, 120 square meters of office space that was full of stuff that we had to slowly get rid of as well. And then all my eBay stuff. Yeah. So it was just, and a lot of it is still there. Yeah. Yeah. We managed to <laughs> come up uh, with a, with it. Uh, so, cause so Cam, who's still with us, Cam watching this, hello. Uh, he's a lot of it's in his office for better or worse. The poor dude's surrounded by my crap, yeah. but you know, we just leased one room now. And then, um, another business leased the rest of the office, which is, which was good. Uh, yeah. So fast forward. Um, you know, we, we house, house sit, and that was probably the best thing we could have done at the time, I think, because it got us used to the, so used to everything that needed to happen. Yeah. And, and just used to living, like living compressed, like as in like Mm. not living with as much stuff and living with other people's stuff. That two months was really good for that because we were using other people's plates. We were using other people's rooms and stuff. Become very respectful of other people's things when they're not your own. Yep. Even the bed situation, the bed wasn't that comfortable, but I had to get used to that. It's like, you know, we're not going to have our $2,000 bed anymore. So we're going to have to get used to sleeping on hard mattresses, soft mattresses and- Pillows that are as flat as- And and that trip, uh, that two months we spent um, really helped with that. So yeah, yeah, by the the time January rolled around, so February 9th is the day we left um, Australia, but by the time January rolled around, we were pretty much ready to go. We had sorted out SIM cards. We had sorted out travel insurance. We had paid for our storage. Everything was in the storage. We'd sold cars. We'd sold everything. The last thing to go was the car. And then we hired a hire car for the next few days to get us around until we literally flew out. We dropped that car off and they dropped us at the airport and that was it. We were... Yeah. But by January, I was pretty much ready to leave. Yeah. I, I, we had ran the business down. We had sorted loose ends and we were really just treading water until the actual Kids flight. needed to do oh, the kids one week of school. So the principal had said to us, you really need to do one week of school and then you can go. So that was that was the only thing that was holding us out until the 9th of Feb was the one week of school. And fast forward three months, we're in Sydney and Kuching, sitting um, yeah. doing our thing. <laughs> and I think, I think, you know, so that's our backstory. That's how we got to this point. Yeah. Uh, you know, this podcast is going to be a lot about uh, the things we're learning along the way, oh, yeah. uh, maybe just some philosophical reasons why we did it, um, because I've really had to change my mindset about money um, doing this trip because, you know, it's, uh, we're, we're lucky we have income coming in from the business, yeah. uh, but we wound it down a lot and that yeah. income dropped a lot. Uh, but the doors first closed. Month and a half, it, it freaked us out a bit, didn't it? Did, it? It, it, did. Just, it freaked us out. Uh, oh. But doors closed. Another one opened. Yeah. You know, one of the perks of coming to Asia, especially, is that it's a lot cheaper than Australia. So, uh, you know, we we had a buffer just by leaving Australia. Um, but you know, I you know I'm a guy, right? And you know, you, you get this mindset that you have to work really hard. Uh, you know, that's your res- yeah, yeah, that's your responsibility yeah. as a man is to work really hard, provide with your family. And when you're in your 30s and 20, late 20s, early 30s, you can do that because you have the energy and stamina. Yeah. And it's taken a lot of getting used to, to to go, well, it's actually okay not to work as hard as I was. And I this trip, it's taken this trip to really realize that uh, because before this, you know, I'd get itchy feet, I'm not working. But there's days where literally nothing happens and I don't feel bad about it anymore. Whereas when I was at home, I used to feel bad because it's like, well, to do something suddenly yep. we, we've forgotten something physically yep. there's something we should be doing and we don't know what it is yep and it, and just a, a guilt thing too because you know we we're sacrificing time with the kids for the business and I, and when i wasn't working i felt guilty about that you know that would that was i was sac- we were sacrificing time with them uh, and i should be working to justify sacrificing that time school holidays literally we would park them in the um 
meeting room of our office yep. and we would work and they would watch TV or colour or play whatever games we'd brought with them. But their school holidays were literally a meeting room in our office. And and anyone that runs a business knows you have to do that sometimes. But, yeah. you know, I just felt guilty about plonking them in front of a TV all day, even though we shouldn't. There's no there's no one going, oh, that's a bad way to do things. It's more just, you know, I, I know that they're only going to be this age for so long. And uh, that's at its call what really tipped me over uh, about going on this trip. And I'm sure you were the same, Pauline. We've had conversations about this. You know, they're only this age for so long. So, so the, long, the, yeah. The boys are only they're six and eight. So there's only like two or three more years where... I have no idea how Liam got to eight. Like, yeah, I he really just don't know one day how, he was eight years how old. Eight years rolled past. Like I, I don't understand. Yep, and uh, you know they're they're only going to be this age where we can educate them through yep. homeschooling and world schooling um, for so long. If they're in high school, you can't really do that. Do they still want to be with us? Yes, they still want to hang out with us. They actually, still love us and want to be with us. And so there's only a certain so fine age they're able to do that. Uh, there's only a finite age where we have the stamina to. Travel, travel like, like this. this, it is hard. Yeah, we're not staying in five star hotels. We're in someone's house in the middle of a we have busy three street. Three flights of stairs yeah. up as well. Had we to had carry, to 20, carry 20, uh, 40 kilos of bags up three oh. stairs. So, like, you only have that, this stamina at a certain age. If you're in your 50s, it's hard to travel like this. Um, and, uh, you know, there's only really a short period in your life where financially you can support something like this, which is kind of where we are now. We're able to financially do this. So, if we hadn't done this trip now, I don't know when we could have done it. and You'd only really have another three to four years in terms of like us and the kids yep. that we could have done it. Yep. So that's, I think, We're, uh, a lot more doing, of doing it, as well. Doing it in a, way, in a place in a way that only adds positives and very few negatives. Yep. You could travel in your 40s and the kids could be teen- teenagers, but there's a risk of more negatives yep. because of schooling especially. Issues. Yep. yep. And, uh, you know, uh, socializing and things like that. Um, but- more deeper than that, you know, there's obviously a lot of perks of driving like this. We're making memories. We're making a heap of having a heap of experiences together as a family. We're getting closer as a family. Yeah. But also I had, you know, when I, in July, when I had this existential crisis, I, I realized that, you know, none of us are going to be here forever. So like tomorrow, you know. I think it also was heightened with your mum because yeah. we, yeah, definitely. in the time, in the last year, was very, very difficult on us with your mum. She'd gone into care. Things weren't going the way it should be. She still had health issues. She was screaming down the phone at us because she was not happy that she was there. So that pressure plus work plus family plus everything else that was going on had all come to a head and you just... Yeah, because mum mum was 70 when she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, so she's not that old and she's healthy. Like my mum's not unfit. You know, she's pretty healthy for a, for a 70 year old lady. Uh, but you know, that just brought home the fact that like, I could just be jogging down the street and someone plonked me with a car and that's it. So I, I didn't want to sacrifice the kids at being this age and go, oh, I, could, I need to work so they can have a better life later. Yeah. If I'm not there to enjoy it with them. What's the point? Yeah. What's the point? I'd rather just invest in experiences. That's how we justified this trip is. Instead of investing in growing a bigger business and having more money, house yep. or whatever, another car. investing in the rat race, yeah, investing in the rat race, we decided that we're going to invest in experiences yeah. uh, because that should be as valuable as buying a second house and buying more getting valuable. a big. Yeah, it, we know that now, but like theoretically at the time, that's how we justified it because it was, you know, we giving we gave up a lot to do this trip, but yeah. um, it's come back full circle. And I know even now, this short period of time we've been doing this, if I was to just die tomorrow or disappear tomorrow the boys would have memories of me that they would never have gotten if we were just in australia yeah. and th- and that's heartwarming for me it's part of the reason we do the other youtube channel too mm-hmm. it's because we had this like documented journey, journey. and all of our values support values and and ethics and everything are in that yeah. and you speak to people that don't have kids uh, like whose parents have died young and, and that's the thing they say is they they missed all those like words of wisdom that you don't get if your parents there are not there so I didn't want to just leave this earth and leave them in the lurch. So I was like, we do this trip, we invest in their experiences, we invest in being a closer family together. Invest in us. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Invest in us. Invest in experiences uh, that we can have together. The other thing too is, uh, I know what I was like when I was fourteen, fifteen, and I'm sure you were the same. You get 
you know, after about 10, 11, and 12, you start to want to spend less time with your parents and do your own thing, right? Yeah. And I feel like a lot of the angst that teenage, uh, teenagers have with their parents and vice versa is they miss out on doing this stuff when they're younger together as a family. And then the parents don't fill their cup uh, of like emotional experiences with their children. The children then don't know how to deal with it, so they just don't want to be around it. Yeah, the parents want to spend more time with them because they've got more money and the resources to do it. And they're, and they're like in their 40s, so they're slowing down. And then the teenagers want nothing to do with it. I, 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 I feel comfortable now, especially after the couple of months that we've done, I feel comfortable now that we, once the kids are a little bit older, 14, 15, I, I feel like we're going to we're gonna have a lot to do with our children right now and for the next couple of years. Uh, by the time they're 14, 15, and they don't want to spend time with us, we're going to be okay with that because we would have had so many good memories together that we can go, actually, let's just let them be their own. Yes. Yeah. You know, we've, we've taught them everything. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we don't have to smother them because we missed out on something that we should have strived for in our 30s, you know, like when they were younger because we're doing that now. Like, you know, the changes I've seen in... So Liam, so our boy's six and eight. Liam's the oldest, Riley's youngest. Liam has always been close to me. He's always been a dad's boy. I think he kind of got thrown into that, obviously, when we had Riley, because I was only 17, but the part yeah. that I had to do with Riley and you had to do with Liam, so yeah. it's been like that for quite yeah. a while. Yeah, so Liam, Liam's always going to be close to me, but Riley hasn't ne- has never really been that close to me. You know, obviously, lo- the love's still there and yeah. things like that, but, like, you know, Liam would come and hug me, Riley Riley wouldn't. And that that was concerning me some, somewhat, not, not to the point where I was like, okay, there's something wrong here, more just like, am I doing enough? You know, as a parent to uh, to encourage that, you know, mm-hmm. like, does he know me well? You know, when we had Riley, I was um, a branch manager of an agricultural dealership working mm-hmm. big hours. And then we went into this business doing, yeah. so all the formative years, the first couple of years of his life, I was working. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that had an effect. And so what I've noticed in this trip in the last three months is that Riley has gotten heaps closer to me. Because we're just spending more time together. Yeah. We, yeah. we have common interests and, and we're just sharing those interests and we have retrospective conversations about things and, you know, about things that we like and don't like and learning more about each other. And that has happened because of this trip. Yeah. Uh, that wouldn't have happened, I don't think, at home. Uh, another thing I've noticed since we got on this trip is that the kids have been, they've become way more resilient, way more resilient. Yeah. And, and we have as, as adults as well, to be fair, I, like I could, you know, this time... Six months ago, I couldn't sleep on a bed that wasn't mine. And how first world of a problem is that? You know, I'm a 30-year-old dude. I wouldn't even switch sides with you yeah. on the bed. Yeah. But there yeah. was no so, switching sides. You know, you start, you look at that stuff and you go, how first world problem of a problem is that? Is like, I, I complain when the bed is not mine. And now we're like, oh, we'll sleep on anything. Okay. Yeah, we'll just, we'll just have to put up with it. Because yeah. what, else, what other choice do you have? You're in a foreign country. You're not going to buy a mattress here. So like, you know, little things like that, but the boys have become super resilient. You know, they, they don't cry for as long if they get upset. They, they are more conscious of their f- how their actions affect us, um, you know. Yeah. And more when, so travel days are the hardest days for us. When you catch an bus, a train, a plane, what, whatever it is, they're stressful because you've got a time deadline. Most days we don't have a time deadline unless we're doing something, but travel days you do. You've got to get up, you've got to get your bags, you've got to get ready. And I think they've finally realised this after many, many issues and stress and all sorts of things. It, go and watch our KL uh, video when we had to leave there because that was one of the turning points. But they have finally realised that they actually need to pull their weight and listen and they deal with it a lot better than they have been. Yep. Yep. Because they know that there's a responsibility and they've got to act on that responsibility. Otherwise, things can happen and there are consequences to their actions. Yep. Yep. 100%. And, you know, we're only three months into this trip. The things could change in three months. Part of the reason we're doing this podcast yep. is to create a bit of a journey, a journal yep. for us to be a little bit more deeper than just the superficial mm-hmm. stuff that we're making on yep. Mitch's on the Rise. Because Mitch's on the Rise is a highlight reel. You know, the adventure, it's yeah. the fun, it's the games, it's the exploration. It's it's designed to be like a bit of a journal for us, but it's also, it's one of our channels of revenue. Yeah. So it's designed to, for eyeballs. So, you know, we're marketers, that's what we do. Uh, but this this channel is going to be way more raw and real. This podcast is going to be raw and real. We ultimately, you know, it, it ups, 
now now that I'm on the other side of the fence, mm. I just wish we had done this earlier. Oh yeah. I really I really wish we'd done this like two years ago when we probably would have been financially in a better position to do it. Um, but you know, I just know there's a lot of families out there, you know, they, look, I'm a guy, right? I know there's a lot of dads out there that are heads of households and there's probably a lot of mums as well that are head of households, but there's families out there that want to do a trip like this. They, they know that for the sake of their marriage or the sake of their family. But they don't even have to be a two per, two adult, two children No, family. what about like, that lady at Sarah We met? met a single mum with two kids travelling through Southeast Asia. She worked online and she just wanted to give her kids the best experiences possible. So there is no one size fits all at all and anyone can do it. Yeah. Anyone. And, and we just want to share our journey on how we did this and then just some tips and ideas on how you can logistically make this happen because it's not an easy task. It's not like being a couple. So when we were traveling uh, 10 years ago, it was literally just go, yep, quit our jobs, put backpacks on and go. Yeah. When you got kids and a family and commitments and businesses and jobs, like exactly. you can't just- Whole ring around. Yeah, you can't. How do you make income when you're on, on, mm -hmm. on a trip like this? How do you support your family? How do you- uh, organize insurance you know it's like those kinds of you questions find accommodation how do you do this like there's just so many what do you, pack? Oh, yeah. you know like we had to do all that research ourselves and we're and there's no and we're just hoping we can create a and we even set a parcel home already yep. like. we're just hoping we can create a resource that makes it that convince even if we convince one family that um yeah. has wanted to do this to just go out and do this trip yeah. that'll make what we're doing worthwhile uh, so that's ultimately the goal of this uh, podcast and, and the, the videos that are going to be on this channel. Like I said, if you're listening to this, jump onto YouTube, look up Families on the Horizon and subscribe to this channel because we're going to be creating videos that are specifically around how you get to this point. So yeah. what to pack, you know, ways to make money online, things like that. You know, the stuff that uh, applies, doesn't matter if you're traveling to Southeast Asia or traveling on a big lap around Australia. It doesn't matter where you go. Yeah. Or, or just an extended vacation. Yeah. I think that uh, it's important to to build a resource that is for families that were in our position eight months ago because it got pretty bleak there. I was so I was I didn't, you were pretty pretty desperate. Yeah, I'm 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 a pretty resilient guy, uh, and I handle stress well. But I, I didn't realize I was that unhappy until we started traveling, and I and I look back and go, man, I was so unhappy. Yeah. Not not with like not. And this is what makes it hard is when you're happy and you don't, there's no, nothing you can complain about to, mm. to cause that. It's like yeah. we had the stuff, we had a happy family and stuff like that. Yeah. So I couldn't really go, oh, I'm ha unhappy because of my wife or unhappy because we have no money. Yeah. There was no like reason if it was worse because I had no reason to be unhappy. And that made it infinitely worse. And it wasn't until I traveled to realize that the reason we were unhappy is because we were in this rat race that we didn't want to be a part of. Yeah, and we didn't realise that. No. So you don't realise it. Until you're on the outside looking Until in. you're on the outside looking in. That's yeah. where I think if you had nothing, you'd actually be happier a lot you, of the time. I feel like you would. We were much happier without stuff in our house. Like, yep. we were still living in the house, but we had nothing except yep. beds, a few kitchen bits, and whatever was left. And it was just so freeing. Yep. Like, it was actually freeing to be like, have my stuff. Just take it. I don't want it. <laughs> we, we, constantly, we made a conscious decision to leave the rat race, uh, you know, and just go, we're not participating in this anymore. We don't need a bigger boat. We don't need, even though we could nest, we could afford that stuff, we just went, we're checking out of this. Yeah. The only reason we we're, yeah, the only reason we're wanting a second home is because that's what we're told we need to have, mm. you know, by our friends and whatever is a status symbol or what yeah. have you. But the thing with just chasing stuff is that you never have enough of it. Mm. Whereas now... And then it consumes... It does consume you because you end up going, okay, well, I need a bigger boat. I don't necessarily know why I need a bigger boat, but, you know, I'm just not happy with what I have. Yeah. And what at its core, what I've found doing this trip is that it's like, actually, we're finding happiness in other stuff. Yeah. You know, we're not... Because we don't have we don't have all the uh, boats, cars and stuff. I would, you know, I'd love to have a Lamborghini and cruise around, but like... We don't have any of that stuff. No. We have two bags and four backpacks. Yeah. So you have to draw happiness from somewhere else. And to be fair, not everyone could do a trip like this, I don't think, because some people find, hap find true happiness in having stuff. 
and that's their that's their more power to them you know but i what i found if i'm being completely honest is that i'm finding happiness in the fact that we're all happy and we're all enjoying ourselves and we're all sharing things that together as like a team yeah. you know like when we go and experience a the theme park it's like with it's not the fact that we're at the theme park and there's all some rides it's the fact that we're experiencing it together, together. and it's like it's like you keep saying this core cool memories and it's like we're just building all these memories together that if one of us was to disappear tomorrow we'd still have and yeah. it doesn't matter if you got a million dollars or two dollars to your name the memories the only things that you actually keep the rest of it goes after you're gone like if you if i was to die tomorrow you know the business would probably be gone we'd sell the house the dynamics would change completely that that um 550 horsepower falcon that i love would probably be gone yeah but the memories you have don't disappear maybe some well yeah my mum's case <laughs> my mum's case yeah maybe some. you know like i mean within reason right like i'm not talking about yeah. like forever but like yeah. just you know it's just you know i don't remember a lot of my childhood and I, I put that down to my dad working really hard and working really hard to support um, support us, but I don't have the memories, which is sad, but it's the uh, it's the truth. Yeah. And you know, I just I, and that makes me sad because it's like, well, I don't want to, the boys, to, our boys, to be in that position where I've worked really hard, and not only do they not have the memories, but they don't appreciate it. Yeah. So that's the other thing I'm finding with this trip too, is the boys, uh, you know. This may sound, this may not be right, but it's just what I believe. You know, I grew up really poor. You know, um, we grew up in poverty. My mum doesn't speak, you know, she's a second English, second language. She got divorced with my mum. We are living next to the railway tracks in Midland. And, uh, you know, we always had food, but we were poor. And that taught me a lot about having things and not having things. Now, that's a good and a bad thing because you get to this point where you start to have money and you start to buy things that you didn't have as a kid. And yeah. you would have seen that when we first got together. I, I bought yeah. stuff. He went through a very, very big, bit long phase of needing stuff. Yeah, needing yeah. stuff. And it wasn't until I was in my yeah. movies till I got really. I didn't understand it. Yeah. Like, I just, I hadn't come from that background. Like, we, my family, I knew that we had some sort of money, not a massive amount, but I knew that my mum and dad worked for a lot yeah, of Yeah, your, your parents were middle class. Like, you had, you know, you weren't, you had disposable, disposable income. Yeah. We, we literally, you know, in Midland, like we were literally that poor because mum mom was a gambling addict too, which um, didn't help. But we, you know, like I, I'd have like spendless shoes that were taped up because we just couldn't afford new pairs of, sh new pair of shoes. So like I'd go and play soccer and uh, I wouldn't have soccer boots because it was like we couldn't afford them. So I'd just be playing soccer in shoes at Wreckham and then I'm going to school with wreck shoes, things like that. So, you know, it is what it is and like, I think it's made me very resilient. Um, but what I've noticed with noticed with our boys, it's definitely not the case now, I don't mm -hmm. think. But we were getting they were getting to the point because we had we have money, you know, we had money, we got the business, and we were supporting ourselves. And and we, I like to live comfortably too. It's not the kids or poor or anything. It's like I enjoy having stuff. Yeah. So I had we had nice things. Uh, what I was noticing is the boys were getting pretty entitled. Because they haven't... They, they, demand, they started to demand things. Yep. They didn't ask for things. They demanded things. Yeah, they and just that expected was getting stuff. on our nerves. Yeah, like, and I was like, really? boys, you don't realise how hard we've worked to get to this point where you actually have the ability to demand stuff. And they'd start crying because they just, they emotionally didn't understand what was going on. So then it was creating a massive... Argue. Yeah, because that would stress me out too. Because yeah. I'm like, guys, just appreciate what you have. Yeah. Because that's the thing growing up poor is like, you don't... There's no use asking for something if you know for a fact you can't get it. So, like, I knew I couldn't get soccer boots. So, what? So why get upset about it? Yeah. It's like, it's not, it doesn't achieve anything. All it taught me to do is, like, if I need to get that money, I have to work out how to hustle and get it. Um, but the boys are getting entitled. And yeah. I, the boys were getting entitled. And that was upsetting me because I didn't want them to grow up to be like that. I didn't want them to grow up expecting people to give them things because... Resiliency is the single biggest and single strongest character attribute someone can have is tenacity and resilience. Yeah. Because if you have those two character traits, you can basically do anything you want. Yeah. You know, the world the world is full of people that um, are entitled. And if you have the tenacity and strength to be able to um, push through that and actually work hard and, and have gumption and get, get what you want, get the bag, 
Uh, they're the people that become the next CEO of companies and start companies and things. And yeah. it was scaring me that the, the boys were yeah. so entitled. Oh, you know, can we have a switch? Can we have a switch? Can we have a switch? You know, he asked us all the time. And I didn't want to teach the boys. I don't want to, still don't want to teach the boys that they shouldn't ask for stuff. The worst thing you can do with kids is teach them to, to, to not ask for things yeah. because when they become adults, they don't ask for things, which is really mm -hmm. bad when it comes from a sales perspective. So I've always taught the boys that if you don't ask, you don't get. And so that put us in a weird situation because I, I wanted them to ask for things, but I also wanted them to appreciate that, dude, that's a $600 gaming yeah. console. Yeah. We can't just pull money out of the thin air, even though we have the money. We can't just pull yeah. the money out of thin air to buy it. You either got to work for it, earn it, or we got to work out some kind of arrangement. And uh, that's what was happening. They just kept asking for a switch. And I was like... But they'd ask for stuff. And some things we'd give them, like, um, you know, maybe a toy that they wanted or something like, like that. But then within a few days, they didn't they, appreciate they didn't it. Care. They didn't it, care. Did, it, was, it was just put in the box or put on the ground and no, no one cared that they'd even had it. So that, it was just really getting to the point of being frustrating. And now but, we've stripped everything away. And go on, actually, this is what you actually need to live. You need some clothes and you need some shoes and you need food. And, you know, they're, low, they're very fortunate they've got a laptop as well, so they've got a bit of entertainment. But you don't need a Lego set. You don't need... We brought toys and they don't... Don't even play with them. They do not even play with them. I've been considering either dropping them off somewhere, leaving them at an Airbnb. I don't know, but no one seems to play with them. They're more than, more than happy to read a book. Or just run around. Play a game with each other. They're being teachers at the moment for some reason. Um, they We've got board games, which they love. Um, so that's probably the best source of entertainment. But these toys that I brought, I thought we had to bring these. Like, they'll need them. I've noticed, where I've really noticed it is like, when we first left for this trip, when we got to Kuala Lumpur. Yeah. Every time we went into a shop, they were asking, can I have this? Can I have this? Yeah, can I have that? So they, were they, they were still in that mentality. Have they done that recently? They haven't for, asked. Not for a long time. Or they actually realise now if they want something, they have to take their money with them. Yeah. So we've given them a bit of money and a wallet. And if they want something, they have to realise, oh, I've only got X amount of dollars, so I, I can't buy that. All they really ask for is different types of food now, but they're not yeah. They're not seeing a widget, like a little toy and going, can I have that? They'd rather buy their own lolly or chocolate or, um, I don't know, some something. But they haven't even done that in a while, are they? They haven't done that in a while. And that's proof that stripping back everything to its core of what you need is like builds. I've spoken to a friend about this and said that, again, that's part of the reason I wanted to do this trip is like, you know, we can't fake that we're not middle of class. You know, we have disposable income. We can't fake that. Yeah. We kind of cut them all on this trip if we didn't. Like, yeah. yeah. We, we, we can't <laughs> fake that we're living hand to mouth because we're not. Yeah. So how do you build stress into a kid's life without actually creating real stress. Like I don't want them, and this is the problem you run into when you grow up poor is that you don't want your kids to have the same life. So you end up surrounding them with stuff, which isn't the right way to go about it. But how, so how can you create stress artificially that doesn't put them in any kind of danger or doesn't affect them tangibly? And travel is one of the best ways to create that stress, um, to create that resilience. Yeah. So us traveling, they're carrying their own backpacks, right? Like yeah. on wheels. You know, just little things like that creates a sense of stress and a, a safe stress that builds resilience. Yeah, every two to three weeks, they're in a different house, a different bed, having to deal with different places, different people, different food. Like everything out of their comfort zone is completely different within a two to three weeks bed. Yeah, and it's and it's a different and that stress is obviously different to not having things and stuff like that. But it's it creates the same outcome, which is resilience. So, you know, I feel like our kids you know, for the moment, at least the short term, um, are better off with us being away because they are learning that resilience. So when they do go back to, uh, when we do come back, we're not doing this forever. So when we do come back to Australia and we start living again uh, in normal society, hopefully they'll have perspective and like, it's actually not that big a deal if I don't have this because we traveled for a year without anything. Yeah. So, you know, they may not realize that till they're teenagers and they have a bit more conscious thought that, that's fine, but they'll always have these. They're at the age now where they remember stuff. So they remember the fact that we've been to escape. They mention that stuff all the time. They mention stuff from three months ago from this trip. And, uh, yeah, I, that was some of that scared me is because I don't want to create the next generation of entitled children. No. You know, it's not healthy for them. 
I don't want them to get upset when someone teases them because there's like bigger problems in the world than, yeah. than you know what's happening right now. But who knows? This is only early days, and we're only three months into the trip. But you know, in a year, we could be completely singing a different tune. Yeah. So should we wrap up? Yeah, yeah. This this has gone longer than we than we wanted to to, but you know that's the beauty about podcasts and long form content is if you don't like it, don't watch it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, we had to get our thoughts out. Yeah, so it's it's no, you don't. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So it's like a just a recap. You know, coming going forward, uh, a lot more of the podcasts we're going to be doing are going to be a lot more practical. Um, you know, just our thoughts. We're going to talk a little bit about our trip and yeah. um, what we've been doing, and also just we're going to pick a topic once a week. Uh, and just talk about our thoughts on that. So if you've enjoyed this, uh, yeah, like I said, make sure if you're watching this on iTunes or a podcasting service, make sure to leave us a review because that's how they work. So leave a review, like it, follow it. And then on, come over to YouTube and make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel because there's going to be videos that we release uh, that you probably won't know about if you're just watching the podcast mm -hmm. that could really help you on the trip like this or listening to what podcast. So, again, I'm Jimmy. And I'm Pauline. And we'll catch you all, you families, on the horizon, hopefully, <laughs> after, after after you watch a few episodes of this. So, uh, this has been fun. It has and been yeah, it has. And uh, my computer's about to die, so we're about to sign out. So, <laughs> thank you, guys. And uh, we'll catch you all next week. <laughs>